In the previous episode of Computerized Start, I replaced the Dallas real-time clock in my Emerson 8000 EC computer, confirmed that the highly touted speech capabilities were apparently muted before retail launch, and discovered that the onboard video supports Plantronics Color Plus mode. Due to the length of that video, I decided to defer the issues I had getting the XTCF Lite and the VGA card working for a future video. Well, this is that video. In this episode, I'm going to show you the issues I ran into while trying to get the computer to play Planet X3 from the compact flashcard. Specifically, the computer did not initially see the XTCF light, and I was not able to test Planet X3 in VGA mode. Sometimes, getting vintage computers to work requires a little bit of troubleshooting. I'll walk you through what I encountered in case you run into a similar situation. My story starts with a computer. How does yours? This video is not intended to be a comprehensive troubleshooting video. I wanted to document how I got the XTCF light to work, as well as look into why I was unable to get Planet X3 to run in VGA mode. Since I was trying to get my last video out before December 2021 came to a close, I relied heavily on what I knew about expansion cards, as well as the information and tools that I already had on hand. In fact, over the past few weeks, I've learned a few tips and tricks that would have helped, and I'll explore some of these in future videos. But if you see something I missed, leave a comment below. Maybe we'll all learn something new, and if you teach me something new, or remind me of something I forgot, I'll pin your comment, and may even show your comment during the appropriate future video. After installing the XTCF Lite and a known compatible SanDisk 1GB compact flash card, I had expected that I would see the XT-IDE Universal BIOS on-screen display during boot. However, the computer still booted into the DOS in ROM. Since the computer was not complaining if you left unbootable disks in the floppy drive, I surmised that the first thing that needed to be done was to check BIOS setup for a boot mode setting. And sure enough, there is a boot device setting which defaults to ROM. The only other option is disk, so I will go with that setting. And after saving and exiting, the computer now boots from the DOS 3.31 floppy disk I conveniently left in the drive. and the XT-IDE on-screen display didn't appear. Time to go check the low-tech wiki. Since I bought the card pre-assembled and presumably pre-tested, I'm going to skip over troubleshooting steps involving assembly errors. I can always come back to those steps later if I do suspect an assembly error or component failure. Ah, here's the section from the wiki on initialization problems. Bullet point three sounds like my issue. BIOS flashing was successful, but the XTIDE Universal BIOS never appears in the post. The first cause is assembly related. I'll skip that for now. The second cause is a compatibility issue with some machines. While this Emerson XT clone is an odd beast, because their example is an IBM PS2 computer model, I am inclined to believe this computer is not in that group of some machines, and we'll also skip that for now. The third cause is a catch-all. I don't know that this computer scans for option ROMs, but it probably does. I also don't know if the default ROM address location of C800 is available. The motherboard does have a second ROM chip, and it could be an option ROM, or it could be the CGA character ROM used by the video controller. But I did try D800, the other supported ROM base address on this card, with no success. 
I just opted not to show that step in this video. At this point in the troubleshooting process, I have ruled out ROM base address conflicts that can be addressed by the jumper alone, so it's time to try the alternate ROM images on the low tech wiki, a late initialization BIOS image, and an FF padded image BIOS. Given a note found elsewhere on the low tech wiki, I think I'll try the padded image first. If that second ROM on the motherboard were mapped to C800, and given that I know that it's an 8 kilobyte ROM based on its part number, it would be occupying C800 to C9FF. The padded ROM image effectively moves the XT IDE BIOS to CC100, which should resolve this hypothetical conflict. And yes, there is a special reason why this image is padded with FF bytes and not 00 bytes. This is because memory chips, including ROMs, pull the bus low to indicate a logic zero. By padding the first 16K of the BIOS image with FF, the flash chip won't try to pull the bus low while the other ROM chip is being read. However, the padded ROM image had no effect on this computer. Given that D800 didn't work, I was not surprised. There's just one more pre-built image to try, and that's the very late initialization option. Fortunately, this image worked. Since I'm recreating this scenario after completing the last video, I have already properly partitioned the compact flashcard and installed DOS onto it, so the computer is able to boot into DOS now. And booting DOS from the compact flashcard seems almost as fast as booting DOS from ROM. Or at least it seems that way because I have created an autoexec.bat file on the compact flashcard so DOS doesn't stop to ask for the current date and time. When I premiered the last video, some folks were concerned about the age of the XT IDE Universal BIOS posted on the Lowtech Wiki. Their wiki has images built from R566, whereas the latest release as of this video is R622. I can say that the age of this BIOS had no bearing on needing the late initialization option. I can also say that the XT IDE Universal BIOS project does not post pre-built BIOS images compiled with this option. Since it is an open source project, I was able to follow their build instructions to create a version of the XT large BIOS image with the late initialization option included. If you would like to see a video on how to compile the XT IDE Universal BIOS, let me know in the comments. In the last episode, I said that I couldn't test Planet X3 in VGA mode on this computer. When I tried, I saw a blinking cursor and heard the Planet X3 music. I have since discovered that if you hit the down arrow key enough times to select the Exit to DOS option on the main menu screen, even though you can't see it, the game does exit to DOS. I also had noticed a distinct lack of color on the VGA output, but until I was able to use the onboard video by means of the RGB to HDMI, I did not know what should be displaying in color. My first theory was that the onboard video was conflicting with the VGA card in some way, and that may still be the cause. There could be another explanation. I don't know for sure, that the VGA card is 100% working. I did notice that Check It has video diagnostics, so I am going to run them with the VGA card installed in the system. But first, I am going to try to enable colors in Check It and... I can't use Check It with it looking like that! So I will run with colors disabled.
and right away, the memory check fails. Wow, there's something seriously wrong with the first 32 bytes of memory on the card. And maybe more, because I don't know if Check It stops reporting further errors after a certain number. Next, Check It does a multi-page screen access test. It looks okay. On to a character test set. I do see 256 different IBM characters, and they look correct from what I remember, but it's asking me to compare this screen with a sample in the Check It documentation that I don't have. I'll go run a video test using the onboard video after this test is complete to confirm correctness. The character attribute test seems to be correct. The on-screen test is behaving as described. Now it's time for a graphics grid test and hello, purple, where did you come from? I'm actually perplexed, purpleplexed at this point. I'm also wondering why I don't see a grid during grid tests one and two. That's nice. I suspect test three shouldn't look like that. This graphics grid testing is off to a poor start. Tests 4, 5, and 6 are also failures. Finally! A grid! Test 7 passes. But tests 8, 9, and 10 also fail. Here's the result of the Check It video tests on the VGA card. 25 failures. Looks like I need to get my order for replacement memory chips in before the Chinese New Year if I'm to get this card working this month. Just to confirm my suspicions, I pulled the VGA card and ran the Check It tests against the onboard video. It will give me a frame of reference for the tests in common with CGA and VGA adapters. And starting with the multi-page screen access test, I see that there should have been colors on the screen throughout the tests, had I been able to successfully enable colors. And while it appears that I did remember what the IBM characters looked like, it looks like there should have been colors on the screen during the character set tests. And the graphics grid tests confirm that there should have been a grid on the screen. Replacement memory chips are now on order. But did I need to do that? After capturing video and while working on this script, I kept thinking that maybe a conflict between the onboard video and this VGA card might explain some of those failures. Time to pull out my 386 computer, which does not have onboard video, and confirm my initial findings. And as you might notice, it's another Emerson computer, an Emerson Elite SX386-16. The important things are that I was able to get it working in a pair of live streams, and that it does not have onboard video. I've installed the same version of Check It on this computer, and right away I see the color interface is working on this video card in this computer. All 262,144 bytes of memory on this card passed. I didn't expect that to happen as the memory addresses that were reported as failing didn't overlap with memory used by the onboard graphics. 
but clearly the two graphics adapters didn't like being in the same computer at the same time. In the interest of time, I'm going to speed through the rest of the tests. Everything passed except the two monochrome display adapter text tests where the screen looked weird and the EGA monochrome graphics test which showed nothing on screen. I know that some VGA adapters had quirks with backwards compatibility and this adapter must have been one of them. I suspect this card is actually working exactly as designed so I guess I will have memory chips for repairing a future failure. Okay, it's time to try launching Planet X3, just to see if it will run on this card. And not surprisingly, it starts as expected. Okay, enough of that. Of course, Planet X3 is going to work on a 386. I just wanted to make sure it would work with this card, since my previous attempt failed. If I had an XT class computer that did not have onboard graphics, it looks like this VGA card would work as expected, at least as long as you don't need to fall back to MDA or EGA monochrome modes. And while I was working on the script for this video, I discovered that Check It 3 has a bug when testing IBM EGA adapter cards with less than 256 kilobytes of memory, and the symptom is strangely similar to what I saw on this VGA card. It's entirely possible that the memory test failures I saw were entirely the result of this bug in Check It, perhaps exasperated by the presence of the onboard video. The 8000 EC might not be able to talk, but it makes for a nice XT class clone to have in my collection. With the information I found on the Low Tech Wiki, I was able to get the XTCF light working, so I have plenty of solid state storage, easily updated from a modern computer using a compact flash card reader. And while incompatible with this PC, I did determine that the VGA card appears to be working as designed, and that it is compatible with Planet X3. You might think this concludes this series on my Emerson 8000 EC, but it does not. I have a few upgrades planned for a future video, and I think you'll like them. So be sure to subscribe and enable notifications so that you don't miss any of those upgrades. If you like this video, please be sure to smash that like button and share it with your retro computing friends. And as always, I do welcome your constructive criticism and upgrade suggestions in the comments. I'm grateful for your subscribes, likes, and comments. I'm also grateful for everyone that participates in the chat during my live streams. Those things do help small channels grow. Being a small channel, I don't have any sponsors. And quite frankly, I would like to keep it that way for as long as possible. So if you feel led to help the channel financially, check out my page on Ko-Fi. There you can send a one-time tip or support the channel monthly. I'm also on Buy Me A Coffee and Patreon, but Ko-Fi is my preferred site for supporting the channel. And while I can't do anything about the ads YouTube inserts, your support could mean that those are the only ads you'll see on this channel. Thank you for watching Computerized Start, the show where I explore the computers of my generation to inspire the next. I hope to see you here for the next video or live stream. Bye!